Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to How to Win at Chess. This is a series where I take on my subscribers in 10 minute rapid games. I go up the rating ladder, walking you through every single phase of the game. I try to mirror the level of my opponent to potentially set them up for good moves. Uh, but I do ultimately try to win every single game in an instructive manner. Uh, this is one of my more laid back series. And this is episode 27. In this episode, we're gonna be playing five subscribers starting at the 900 uh, rapid elo uh, and going up to 2000 uh, and as always this series is sponsored uh, by nobody uh, but the namesake of how to win at chess is actually my book so if you uh, are a beginner uh you know anything below the level of 1200 rapid or you have a relative or a friend you'd like to uh, get the book that's uh, that's the name of the series it's on the book uh and uh, if i play any of my openings then uh I will shout out one of my courses, and they are available on Chessly, which is my, uh, my chess educational platform. So I am the sponsor of my own content, if you would like to take your chess learning to the next level. Other than that, we, uh, in the words of Ernie Johnson on TNT, inside the NBA, unsullied by sponsorship since 1989. I think that's what they say. Anyway, this is game number one. Uh, I'm playing Perco. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're starting out early, uh, and I, and I feel like to, you know, we'll, we'll ease into it. I'll play D4 for my first white game. I like to mix it up, so sometimes I play three games with black, two games with white. Uh, today I'm going to be playing three games with white. And, uh, I, I would, I mean, I really want to play a London, but I feel like I will be Londoned myself. But, uh, the Queen's Gambit is always, is, is always a fun one as well. Let's just begin with a London. Let's let let's show let's show how to play this opening at the 900 1000 level. It's a very common opening. Nobody has an antidote to it. Uh, you could play a little bit more aggressive and tricky London with knight c3 knight b5, but uh, I'm just going to play a normal London. Um, you know, and 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 knight out to f3 versus not knight out to f3 is kind of a very small detail that's not that important. This is already a slight misstep. My opponent really should be dealing with the London by playing D and C pawns out together. Uh, there's no, this isn't a horrendous move, but it blocks the C pawn, and from C6, the knight actually doesn't really put a substantial amount of pressure on the center. What I like to do when my opponents do this is I actually like to turn the game back into a Queen's Gambit. So we played a London, but seeing as though this is how our opponent reacts, it's like any, it's like tennis or, or boxing. Like if you see your opponent reacts to something that you're doing, you can then proceed to, uh, to, um, to, to play in a slightly different way and, and, and go about things in a slightly different way. Now, a lot of people here would react to this pin. This is, you know, generally a, a decent move. If you are pinned, just sort of ask the question. Sometimes taking is actually bad for us, but I would refrain giving up a bishop this easily uh, for, for not a particularly strong reason. Uh, and so now my opponent did the right thing. I mean, they got out their light squared bishop. They put a bunch of pawns on light squares. We have the option to continue to try to play like a queen's gambit. Uh, we can give our bishop out and we can castle. Since this was sort of what, I'm, what I was going for originally, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. It's not the best move, uh, and it's not the best move because actually we, we do have a little bit of open air here now that we brought our queen over there. Okay, my opponent plays bishop you know, there instead of knight here. A lot of questions to ask yourself here, right? The opponent plays bishop d6, like, do we take? Generally, no. That's just sort of something you learn as you get better at chess. Generally, no. You, you really don't want to take that bishop. It only helps black develop. You really shouldn't make trades that only help your opponent develop. Like how our opponent took us. Uh, you know, you, you want to be careful and make sure you're well protected here. I think we are. Uh, and uh, we could take. There's nothing, you know, wrong with taking the pawn to reopen the bishop. But just good rule of thumb. Like, if you don't have to take and you don't see an immediate reason why you should, you don't, you don't have to. Like, you could just make an improving move. And, I mean, this is generally going to be an improving move. Uh, if black captures, we will take with the bishop, which helps us get out. I've already talked about this a lot. You, you kind of want to avoid taking an opponent's piece if a new piece will emerge in its place and you don't have one, right? Like, again, like, I, I don't really want to allow the queen out unless I have a follow-up, and I don't. I, just because I can attack the queen doesn't mean 
that's going to be a, a good decision for me. So uh, I have bishop d3. I have a handful of options here. Uh, and uh, bishop d3 actually does run into this move knight to b4, which is annoying. Uh, and uh, I kind of want to play it just to be instructive and, 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 and see if my opponent finds it. I also don't really want to handicap myself because this is not a good move because of this incoming knight to b4. Uh, some of you may be wondering, why won't we take this pawn? After pawn takes, pawn takes, that's fine. But if we take with the knight, and then they take with the knight, and then we take and stop there, we lose the game. Because we have to think, and it's a common tactic, chess is all about pattern recognition. There's going to be a queen on that square, there's going to be a queen on that square, and our opponent can just play bishop to b4 check and win our queen. And that's hard to see. If you're sitting at home going, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Uh, pawn takes, pawn takes, our knight goes there, so this diagonal actually opens. We're a lot better off, actually, just developing a piece, let's say to e2, and then castling. Like, getting the king to safety here will actually serve us uh, a great, a great deal. Another useful move is actually pawn to a3, which generally, these, these kind of a3, h3 moves are sort of useless. In this case, it was useful. It wasn't necessary. I probably should have just developed a piece, as we are sort of realizing now. I'm a little bit behind in development. This is actually a decent move, because this is annoying. Not that, but this. Oh my goodness, I am... I, I, can I draw that out? Okay, this is insane. Can I draw that out? There we go. See, knight to b4. Exactly. My opponent does this. That's not a good move, though. It would have been better if my bishop was on that square. This is a very easy move to parry. Number one, I can just move my rook. Number two, I can just castle. Both are probably fine. Uh, castling allows the knight to come here, but it's not particularly dangerous. But this would have been a lot more powerful when, if my bishop was on that square, because it would have threatened my bishop, my pawn, and still continued to threaten that fork if my bishop moved. That was a bit advanced, uh, and I think an, an average 900 in this position, if I uh, in this position, if I gave them this position, might play bishop here, or might blunder and, and ultimately, you know, get hit with that tactic. Um, I'm not going to lose a queen to these, you know, to to to, to these subscribers. No, no, uh, no way. Uh, C6 is solid, uh, and and now now we can ask the question to this knight. I'm still not taking the bishop. We're doing something here called keeping the tension. I do have to speed up though. Like if this was a real game, I'm doing a very poor job managing my time. Being down two minutes is not good, uh, and and I can teach you a little bit about speeding up. Uh, in general, the best way to speed up is to play uncomplicated moves that just improve something. A lot of people speed up by just capture, 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 and that's not that, that sort of breaks the principle of, of everything that we've discussed already. A, a basic improving move might be to move the pawn two squares to gain more space, or to bring a rook. Biggest question in chess is where do you put the rooks? You put the rooks where you anticipate the position opening without blocking in the other rook. So if I anticipate the position opening on the C file, I would put a rook on that square, but I wouldn't put that rook on that square because that would block in the rook, right? So I would probably put my rooks on D1 and, and C1 like that. Uh, or, the, you know, maybe E1, maybe, maybe, but... Now, I don't know what my opponent is thinking about. They have to go here. This is a very poor investment of time for black. Uh, this is absolutely just... there is That's a one-move calculation. You just... Yeah. And so now, again, if I want to play a move quickly here, I might just take some space. I don't know if it's the best move, but I'm taking a little bit of queenside space. Every time we advance a pawn, we got to think about what got weaker. This stuff got weaker. My knight is now not protected. Is that a big deal? We'll find out. The other question is, where's my pawn going? Am I trying to play c5 and b5? Am I just trying to play b5 in one go? The truth is, uh, at 900, it might be tough to discern all those differences. But as long as you're not making a blunder, the longer you don't make a blunder as a 940, the higher your winning probability. So to be honest, at 940, both of those moves are good. But at a certain point, you've got to play where you're a little stronger. Right now, black is not a little stronger anywhere. Uh, black center is sort of like equal equity, but black can't really do a lot of advancing. And in general, in chess, if you can't really make forward moves... It's a bad sign. I can make a lot of forward moves. I, I can move my, 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 my bishop. 
Uh, I can go here, here, I can take, I can probably push my pawn, I can play bishop d3. I have a lot of forward moves. So again, I can take the bishop, but let's just let's just advance this pawn finally. Big question of whether black will take or not. Yeah, and, and black is, you know, in this level where you, you do sort of want to take. I think uh, sort of want to take, meaning that's just what 900s do. It's not necessarily good or bad, it's just life. Um, I took with the queen just not to break my structure, but pawn takes is totally fine. It weakens this a lot, but it completely locks down e5, whereas queen takes doesn't really lock down e5. That move, unfortunately, is a big blunder. And like I said, at the 900 level, if you outlast your opponent in blundering, uh, you will win. And um, it was very important for my opponent to snipe my bishop. So anytime there's a bishop on the other side, look at where it is looking. And uh, when I played c5, this opened up. And I might have even taken the knight to damage the structure, but I'm definitely going to be taking the knight when it's a free knight. And uh, this is, you know, that's a big deal. A, a free knight, you know, and, and this is life. This is life at 900. I mean, my opponent played very, very well. I sort of kept the tension the right way, just applied a little bit of pressure. And again, again, the caveat throughout this series is like, people are playing me, they know it's gonna be a video, like people are a little bit more nervous, a little bit more elevated heart rate. Um, when a bishop ventures out like this, you do have to be a little bit careful of the bishop not getting trapped. Uh, right now, I feel like a lot of people might, you know, might, might start marching forward. You know, you know what's, you know, for me, I, I might just go back. Like if it doesn't blunder anything, just get out. Just so, just, just get out. You know, you it's not the best move, but like, let's just get out of there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try to we're gonna try to methodically chip away with pawns. We can trade the queens as well, but then our pawn goes in to die. So there's not a benefit to rushing into trading the queens. But like I said, the side with uh, the side without forward mobility is 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 likely going to be in bad shape. So I see this right away. I'm just thinking, let me just trade that pawn, right? If pawn takes, the rook opens up, but I'm going to take with the rook. I'm not going to take with the knight. And, you know, I, could I play e4, get these pieces off the board? Probably. But again, I'm thinking if, if this comes here, the queen opens up. So I'm always looking at how do my decisions impact the other side as well. It, it, chess is a constant game of drawing arrows for my opponent's pieces. So much of it is drawing arrows for what my opponent sees. I see my pieces. I know they want to go here. They want to give a mate. Like, what does my opponent want? And how do I make sure they get nothing? And right now, Black's getting nothing. They're down a bishop, and they, they don't have a lot to show for it. And that's, that's the most important part here. So that's kind of how it goes. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's sort of... It's life. Take a pause there. Take a sip of my coffee. All right, we're going to take down. That opens up our rook. Uh, black really, I mean, a lot of the position is difficult here, but black does have to be a little careful not to allow me to have a pass pawn. If black plays rook c8, which is a very natural move, I might need to kind of show the two techniques uh, for winning a chess game. There's two techniques. One is to go to an endgame. Right, try to trade queens, try to trade pieces. Uh, the other is to go for mate. And as you get better, you're gonna get to a stage where you, you mentally you're like, if I got a few moves in a row, how would I conduct an attack from the from the position that I have? Now, so I'm thinking here. I'm thinking get my queen over, not there. Get my queen over here. Maybe g4, g5, right, maybe e4 a little bit later. Probably the best move was to double my rooks. My rook doesn't really have a place anywhere else. So doubling would have been smart. If the question is, where are you going after you double? I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, in reality, a move like e4 probably opening up the position, dealing with the consequences of that queen would be the best. I wouldn't even be shocked if trading the queens was, was, was all that bad. Uh... But, uh, okay, that move does stop what I want. But now, now, now I'll go back to this plan. We, we can't forget. This, this was another idea. Like, let's, let's try to open the position a little bit. Let's try to hop in there with our knight. <clears throat> also, we are up a lot on time now. Again, 
there's the caveat of you're playing me, you might be a bit more nervous, blah blah blah. But uh, yeah, this is the, this is the way we would we would convert this. You know what? Let's trade. Let's go back to the other game plan. Let's trade. Another secret to winning a game like this, you probably can sack a piece for a couple pawns, but you need to make sure you have enough pawns that, uh, that you're going to guarantee to win the game. For now, I see an open file, so I'm just going to improve my rook, right? Now, the knight can take a step back to then take a couple steps forward, but what I would avoid doing is putting the knight in front of the rook because then you can get pinned. Like, rook e8 here is an auto, and then I'll show you how to get out of that. But, you know, I can't move my knight forward. I can if I sack my bishop. Okay, be careful. Don't lose the rook. I'll put the rook all the way on the back rank because, again, I'd like to trade pieces. So the less pieces my opponent has, the easier my life will be. Uh, and then you just have to win the end game. This is not exactly... You see? You see? I'm, I'm, I'm under some pressure. Uh, I'm going to now show you the technique to get out of this, which is king f1. But now if my opponent doubles again, I, I'm, I, I could get a little bit stuck, which is why you want to avoid doing stuff like this. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so now, since the bishop is defending the knight, I can move the rook. But that's lucky, because that's not always the case. So I'm going to go here and offer a rook trade. And uh, that, that's a kind of an example of why you got to be careful tying your pieces together. So even in a totally winning position, the game is not over. Uh, and I, you know, I, I appreciate my opponent uh, playing those moves. And if I didn't have a bishop, I would be in a lot of trouble. Now, of course, I'm going to trade. That was, uh, that, that, was, that was always, you know, that was never in doubt. And, and now I'm going to target the pawn. It's, de it's better to target the pawn because it can't move. And now we're back here. And this, this is bad. This is bad news. Uh, this means that we will likely, you know, we're likely going to accomplish something pretty soon. Um... My knight is still a little bit stuck. I mean, I'm going to play this move just sort of out of inertia, but I actually can't get in. Like, the best move is unquestionably sacrificing a bishop to try to, you know, get a, get a, a pawn back and get in. But I'm 900. I mean, right, if I'm playing like a 900, I'm going to try to use my pawns. I'm going to try to use... But we got to find a way to zigzag in with our knight. And right now, we don't have a way. Right? We just don't have a way. So a lot of 900s here would get desperate. They start pushing their pawns. They, that's what they would try to do. Um, and okay, that makes my life a lot easier, right? So if, if, if you're just going to leave me in an end game of Bishop Knight versus Knight, I'm going to win, right? So here we can snap take. And the way you win this end game is you have to get your King involved. You got to make sure the Knight doesn't get in and eat the pawns. So that unfortunately is a blunder. And once my Knight is going to get in, it's also going to be able to reroute. And then I will be totally winning. Knight E4 is a clever idea. Uh, to disconnect. So even if I blunder my knight, my opponent resigns. But I was going to say, if, if, if something like knight e4 was played, I, I can just take. You know, black is going to get this, but you can play king e5, king d6, but even if you have an imbalance of two pawns versus one, you can just offer a pawn trade, and yeah, black's just not in the square. And even if black is in the square, you, you can walk your king... And even if you don't do that, like you play c7, you're still winning because you have so many pawns. So you can play king c5 or... Uh, so yeah, I mean, in this game, we, we had a very solid opening. It was very equal. But this idea night before was slightly incorrect. I mean, the computer says it's fine, but the computer also says you want to go back. So like after this, white got a bit of an advantage and I kind of took some space. But after c5 and, and all of this, b6, of course, being a, a big mistake, black is just worse here. Black is a little bit passive. And I would recommend to avoid things like this in the future for, uh, for my opponent to play a move like c5. Just a little bit faster. It's, it, it's, it's just a little bit better to play c5 instead of putting a knight on c6. But overall, I mean, again, if you want an opening to attack the London, uh, you, you, you have to learn something. You have to learn something on YouTube or something in a course that actually attacks the London and puts it under fire. Um, you want to avoid things like knight b4. You probably want to focus more on e5. So you can try to play like, you know, for a quick e5 push like this. If you're going to play knight c6, focus on e5. That's what I would say for my opponent. And okay, obviously the blunder is the blunder. That's, uh, that's life and that's sort of how it goes sometimes. Um, second game, I'm playing a subscriber from turkey or i don't know maybe just the person that has a turkish flag this person is rated 1209 so we're moving up about 300 points 
Uh, this person plays d4. I wonder if I'm gonna get Londoned. Uh, let's let's test out a Dutch defense. Uh, I really do like me a, a Dutch. We'll see if my opponent is a Queen's Gambit. Okay, they are a Queen's Gambit player. They'll play knight f6. Most common line here is, is for white to put two knights out into the center, which plays directly into the Dutch hands. I have an opening uh, course called the Gotham Dutch. And the free sample chapter is this. So you don't have to actually pay for the course. You can just go and get this whole sample chapter for free. I love this. This, in my opinion, is one of the most fun duchess to play. This is one of the lines. Uh, what I like to do here is, again, I just like to ask this question. If they go here, they lose the bishop. So yes, many people take. Technically, technically, the best move is to take the knight because it's check and you damage the pawns. But you'll probably, you know, you'll do that on the next move. Um, but some people here will play like queen b3 and there's a very funny line here where you can trap a queen um, And uh, that's not it. That's if they play queen b3 again Technically best line is to capture right now uh, But what I like to do is I like to wait I like to wait for my opponents to waste time because I was gonna take anyway So I'd rather make progress until one of my opponents plays a move like a3 technically white can play rook c1 and now they would not be damaging their structure. So you're, it's a, you know, you're kind of playing a little game with your opponent. Since you have these... Uh, <laughs> this is why you watch the series. Now we take, because we were going to do that anyway. So now white lost a little bit of time. And since you have all these light squared pawns, you're going to put the bishop on this diagonal. And to me, this opening is one of the easiest openings to play by far for black. Because white gets this cluster. And this cluster is very solid, but it is so hard to understand how to move it. White struggles to move the e-pawn. The d-pawn weakens this. c5 just looks insane because you damage your structure. a4, we just play a5. That plan is sort of gone. All right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's... Um, this is sort of how it goes. Now, okay, white's going to castle. And now, now's the big moment uh, in the Gotham Dutch. We sort of get our structure. Um... It's usually d6, knight, d7. That's sort of how I like to finish my development. I find, I find that I don't like to put the knight on c6 to block my bishop. Another way to play this is to play uh, bishop a6 to target that pawn and play knight c6, knight a5. But to do that, to put the knight and bishop like that, you need to have a pawn on c5 first. Queen d3 is an interesting move, but um, I don't get it actually, because you can't play e4, and also I can put the bishop on e4 now and sort of push you out. So I am curious what the idea was behind this move, but sadly I cannot talk to the subscribers. Like I said, Gotham Dutch, you get 12 moves easily on the board, and then you kind of have to understand the plans of your opening after, just like in the London, and in any, any opening, right? Knight t2, very sophisticated. Wow, this is a... Uh, that's very sophisticated. So my opponent wants to trade with me I think, but they don't want to damage their structure. Now, what's interesting, or, or they don't want to block their queen. What's interesting is that they actually blundered a pawn. They actually blundered a pawn. Uh, the drawback is that I would open up the G file to my king. But this is an instructive moment in chess. In chess, you have to evaluate positions with specific moves or ideas. What I mean by that is, you cannot just go, rather, let me, let me take a step back. You cannot evaluate a chess position by words. You cannot say, bishop takes, rook here, that's scary. Scary is not an evaluation, it's a human emotion. That's why computers are better than humans. They don't experience emotions. You have to evaluate things based on concrete ideas. After bishop takes rook g1, bishop back, what is white's concrete idea in that position? And if you don't see one, you should play the move. Now, as you get better in chess, you're going to get to a point where you calculate everything correctly, like this idea, or you're going to miss something, right? Like as you're growing up in, in, in chess, you're going to miss things or you're going to see things. Bishop f3, okay, fine. I mean, we can trade. We can block our, you know, but I, I, I don't see anything wrong with this. And now we're just up a pawn. We're up a pawn, but we do have the responsibility of not getting checkmated. Right? We're going to 
finish up our development. Now we're going to sort of say, all right, White, I mean, you sacked the pawn and you do have an attack on our king. Now prove it. The best thing for White to do here is probably to castle and double up the rooks or play king e2 and double up the rooks. And then we got to fight back. And probably the best way to fight back is in the center. So the best, you know, way for us to complicate things in this position will be attack the center of the board. Anytime you're being attacked in chess, you want to strike back in the center, but it's a balancing act. It's a, it's a mix of striking back in the center and respecting our opponent's threats. Even if our opponent takes here with a doubled rook, we're going to give up our queen, but get two rooks back. Okay, king, king e2 is... This is edgy stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, this is, this is really impressive. The best move here, unquestionably, is to strike back in the center. We can play rook f7, we can wait, but we gotta go here because now we're actually, we're calling the shots. We have a threat and white has to play our game. Now, if they take, we can't take with the pawn because we lose our queen, we, we lose our knight. Take, take, you lose this. Something more difficult to see. Take, knight takes, they have a check, right? So when this opens, you gotta make sure that check is not fatal. I saw that. If you don't see that, that's how you lose games. I also saw the fact that when this opens up, our knight is hanging. But if we take with the knight, with the knight, we're threatening a trade. We are threatening a trade. The less pieces our opponent has, the less chance they have of successfully attacking our king. And we're up a pawn, so we're going to be better in every endgame. Now, if the opponent gets the knight out of the center, I'm going to shove the queen back so, ba so fast because I know that those are the pieces that want to come attack me. And then I'm going to keep attacking. Right, I'm going to... Right, so now knight takes e5. Now I'm expecting this check. Just like the last game. It's an option of keep pieces on the board or go for an endgame. Try to trade some pieces. To be honest with you, we can check after the game what's better. I think I just want to trade the pieces. We are now threatening a queen trade and a knight trade. White can go for both or one. White can't go for zero. If white moves the queen somewhere, we take the knight. Actually, it's even worse than that. We probably take this pawn. Uh, so if white trades the queens, we can take with the king, rook, or we can get the knight out of the center and say, I don't want a knight trade anymore. Probably the safest move is to take with the rook, but actually king takes is totally fine. Uh, it gets out of the way. There's no check that matters. We would just take back and look what we have left white with, which is exactly why the Gotham Dutch is so powerful because it leaves white with very difficult uh, pawn structure in the future. So again, I'm going to just, uh, it's really tough for me to play rook takes because I know it's not the best move, um, but I'm going to show you why it's not the best move. It's not the best move because it disconnects the rooks on the back rank. And after white trades knights, white gets the open file. So let's see if my opponent capitalizes. You see, normally I would play, that's not the best move because I can also trade rooks, but even you know, more important than trading the rooks is um, probably taking the open file. A lot of people would play rook f6 here and uh, lose a lot of their advantage. The rook's not scary. I mean, the rook, you know, is trying to go there and be annoying. In the end game, the most important thing is unquestionably the open file. Like, life will become so much simpler. Now, I think white wants to go here. Attacking the pawn from behind. It's a good move. It's a good decision. Uh, I'm going to push the pawn because I have no other move. Uh, and then we're going to try to double up. But the reason taking back with the rook was bad and the king was better, or even the knight, is precisely because if I kept my rook on the back rank, I would have been able to fight for the open file because my rooks would have defended each other. It's very sophisticated stuff. Also, if my king took the queen, uh, the rook wouldn't have been able to make it down here. Now the easiest way to untangle in this position would be to trade the rooks, take the open file, and bring the king. Trade the rooks. If you want to win a rook endgame, you should trade one pair of rooks. And now we go here. And now life is good. Probably white will play rook c6. And we, we have to win this endgame. It's definitely not over. Um, the way we win this is we, uh, we, we walk the king over and we try to trade the rook. I... Don't actually see another way. I mean, we could play rook e7 and try to zigzag the king that way. Uh, but, uh, I, I mean, I don't see anything else. So let's play... 
yeah, I mean, let's play king e7. <laughs> we want to play rook here, right? But we can't because they would take our pawn. Trading the rooks wins because we're up a pawn in the endgame. Let's not forget that. Simplification. We have more pawns. We have seven pawns. White has six. So rook trade just wins mathematically. c5, instructive. I would not take. I would not take because I don't want to split my pawns up. So we're, you're learning a lot. I would not take because I don't want to split my pawns. Is it still probably winning? Yeah. But it's not checkers. Is it still winning? Probably. You know what? I'll probably even play it just to show, because I feel like a lot of 1200s would just take, right? They would say, ah, it's fair trade, but I wouldn't do this. But what this enables is my king. Like, my king can walk forward now, which it couldn't do. Uh, white's going to go here, of course. And I'm going to defend this pawn by moving my c-pawn up one square which I think is instructive. But I'm making life a little bit more difficult for myself. And what generally happens in these rook endgames is they're draws. They are drawn because they're very tough, they're very annoying. Uh, and the only way for me to win any of my opponent's pawns... Okay, that's an interesting move. The only way for me to win any of my opponent's pawns by infiltrating with my rook would be to probably lose one of my own pawns back here. Now, I think a lot of people here would play moves like g5, just sort of go... It's not a bad move, uh, but we have to protect our weaknesses in the endgame. We got to be very careful. And the best move for white is to try to hunt down my weaknesses. My rook is very passive. Uh, but when I go c6, rook b7, my rook will very quickly become active on the open file. White should try to bother me. Aha. Uh -huh. Now we have a moment. We can take, take, or ignore. We can also take, ignore, take, ignore. You want to create a pass pawn. And in an ideal situation, you create a pass pawn on the outskirts of the board. So to me here, my gut tells me to take and push. You can also just push right away. It's very difficult to decide which one is better. All right, take and push or just push. Let's go for take and push. Can you take twice? Probably. Also, this move doesn't, right? I mean, just be careful, but... It's probably fine. I want to keep pawns together. I'm tired of splitting up my pawns, so I'm going to go here. I just got to protect these pawns. Just got to protect those pawns, right? So now I have, I'm getting those pawns, right? And those pawns are going to be annoying for white to deal with. White is going to have to defend against my advancement on that side of the board. You see how like in chess, we're like, we're winning, but we're not going to trade all the pawns. Simplifying is good. We want to trade when we're up, but simplifying too quickly might make us... It might throw us into a drawn endgame. It, it's, it's a balancing act. It's hard to perfect. Sometimes multiple things are good. Sometimes they're not all good. All right. Can I win the endgame if I take and play king e5? Probably. Probably. But I'm going for this because chess is about decision making. I want to get my rook on the second rank to win that pawn. And then I want to push my pawns. Right. So I'm going to go king e6. You can't, no, 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 no. This is insane. This is, this is crazy. Um... I'm going to take, and I guess my opponent wants to run the king over here, but, but, this, but this, this, is, this is nuts. You, you can't do this. I mean, you, you, you cannot trade rooks in a 5-on-4 endgame. It's, it's, it's crazy to play like this. Um, king f2, I, I probably can even just run forward. Yeah, but, but no, but this, is, but this is nuts. This is nuts because I just play h5. And as long as the king doesn't walk in and eat everybody, you, you can't. No, no, this is a big decision. Uh, big, big, big mistake, big decision. I'm just going to, you know, now I have a constant threat of promotion. I might even just be winning, right? I might just go G3 and yeah, you can't do that. And that's instructive. I mean, it's instructive. You, you, you cannot simplify in a, into, a, into a pawn end game unless you are 100% certain it's correct. But especially if you're down pawns. I mean, it's, all, it's losing probably 95 out of 100 times. So yeah, now I'm threatening not to take back, by the way. Yeah, so what my opponent missed is that uh, my, my threat was not to go here. My threat is to go g3, take h3. And uh, that was the threat. And now you have to be in the box, and you are not in the square, the box. And now I just win. So that was instructive. I mean, that could have went on a lot longer. This would have went on a lot longer. I think also, again, there's a little bit of like, oh, I'm playing Levy, I'm going to lose anyway, or whatever. But... Uh, to improve at 1200, this, like that, that end game was very important because at 1200, games will go long, and my opponent resigns, but games will go long 
And, you know, this is a losing endgame with best play, um, probably. But it's holdable for white. Like, it's, it's definitely holdable. Uh, I would not rush to trade this many pawns. And, you know, the computer says takes, takes. G4 is good. It likes G4. It does like this idea. Um, if I had just gone G4 right away, it likes it a little bit less. It's probably still a good idea, but... And you'll notice it didn't like creating a pass pawn in the center because it's too close to everything. So the evaluation here is minus 0.6, but the evaluation here is double. Double, if not triple almost, right? Double, about. So it's like that a lot more. It's very instructive, right? And I mean, that type of stuff, like take once and push, take once and push in the end game, that comes with time, right? That comes with experience. Uh, and uh, one more important lesson in this game, the Gotham Dutch, by the way, great opening, highly recommended. Check it out in my, in my courses list on Chesley, but also just check out the free sample. Maybe I'll put a link in the description to, um, to that if you'd like. Uh, I'm telling you, like, this course is great. I love this course. And uh, even the free first chapter is, is awesome. Uh, well, I thought White played pretty well, but instructive moment here. Don't be afraid of things if there's no concrete follow-up. There was no concrete follow-up. It was just the file is open, and that's scary. But trading the bishop was not the right way to go. You just lost a pawn, right? And now definitely the best move is to castle... And then, you know, e5, and we would have had a game. I mean, my opponent would have gone here. That probably would have played king h7. Queen f7 here actually doesn't work because knight takes, but that's, you know, a slightly, as a calculation type of thing. Uh, but I thought this was, you know, correct. And e5 is the top computer move, striking back in the center in the anticipation of the attack. So a lot of instructive stuff. I would rewatch the commentary over. Uh, I, I think I'm very detailed in my thought process and all the important moments. And I try to summarize them at the end of the game. Uh, but uh, yeah, here the best move is knight takes f7, actually. Relieving this knight from its duty. Uh, this is okay. And this is definitely the best move. But black is still fine. But I would, I, I would say uh, for, for this level, I would say king takes is the best move. Because you get a rook to d8. And that's the most important thing. Like to me... This is by far the easiest endgame to win, once you can connect your rooks. Okay, two games down. Let's play the third one. Um, I'm now going to play Dark Knight. 1600. Last time I played D4. Last time, uh, in episode 26, I played in English. I have white again. So maybe I'll play in English in that game. This time I'll play e4. Okay, Karo Khan. So I, I've played fantasy before. I've played a lot of different stuff um, against the Karo Khan. I'll play d4. I'll play the advance. Advance is the most popular. Yeah, okay. My opponent is playing the Gotham Karo Khan against me. The best line here, you have to know this. If you're going to play the advance... Against this, you have to know captures, at least. Knight c6. Now, knight c6 and e6 are the two most common moves. Um, e6 is slightly better. Knight c6 is fine. Uh, the best line against knight c6 is in my e4 course, which is the move pawn to f4. And if a person doesn't know what they're doing here, they could get themselves in a ton of trouble. A ton. Most people here play bishop f4 or knight f3, which gives black a comfortable game. At top level, knight c6 is almost completely gone because white can just hang on to this pawn and then hang on to the rest of the pawns as well. A lot of people go here, you play here. Now, a lot of people here play d4, which is a very natural move. It's probably the best move. If they don't play d4, you play c3, and black's in serious trouble. Like right now, I can play knight f3 or c3. I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, but the best line is like some crazy g5 stuff. So if my opponent knows that, then, you know, good for them. Um, I'm trying to think. c3 or, or knight f3. Is there a huge difference? 
Let's develop our knight. I mean, we might as well. Wherever the knight moves, we will slide the bishop out of the way. It will continue to defend our pawn. And our idea here is very simple. We want to play c3. We want to get the knight off the board. And we just want to maintain our extra pawn. So this is the problem. If you don't know this, this variation at this level, 1600, 17, 18, 2300, whatever, you're going to be down a pawn. You're going to have less space. Within 15 moves, you will be completely lost. Because it's chess. Like, it's very... Hard to play black, be down a pawn, and be down space. Okay, so I'm going to play bishop f2. I believe an idea like g5 here is the best move. Maybe not exactly in this position, but that's sort of the concept. Uh, although here I, yeah, queen a5, but see now this doesn't work because I can trade queens very quickly and, um, and get a very comfortable game. But yeah, this is definitely still the right idea. And uh, actually, you know, now that I'm looking at it, bishop here, yeah, my opponent will be taking on f2. Okay, so actually, they, they, I think they got themselves out of trouble. Yeah, now they can play bishop c5. It's a very nice idea by my opponent, actually. Very nice idea. Now this is the best move, because there's an in-between move. Let me explain myself. In this position, if my opponent had played queen a5 check, and I played queen d2, and they took, I would have taken the queen, and I would have removed the defender of the bishop. However, in this position, if they take, and I remove the defender of the bishop, they can take with check. The difference is that knight f5 forced my bishop to a square which they missed! Oh, I thought that was their whole point! Oh, now black is completely lost. Oh, no. Oh, no. That was so clever. Oh, I thought my opponent... I gave him so much credit. Now they're just completely lost. Now they are fulfilling the destiny. They are down a pawn. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, man. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, now, now I'm completely winning. Now I'm going to push the knight out of the center, restrict it, and now black is fulfilling the destiny of down a pawn, down space. Oh, that was so clever by my opponent because they could take and sneak in a check. And then, and then white is a little bit better, but not up a pawn. And uh, that's, that, that's kind of the way I, I like to play this advanced Karl Khan. I like to take, I like to do this. If you're sitting at home, by the way, wondering, I can't believe chess is all memorization. You need a little bit of knowledge pre-game to play chess, like in any sport. I mean, you need to know how to serve. You need to know how to do certain things, certain technical things to get an advantage over an opponent. Like if you're showing up and you don't know how to do anything, why compete, right? That's sort of the point. So now I'm going to play C3 and I'm going to show you this kind of rock-solid formation with B4 and... A lot of things are good here. I can probably already kick the knight out of the center, but this knight is not intimidating. Right? A5 is a very common move to stop B4. Makes a lot of sense. Now I will, I will play this G4 move just to kind of show you like the ultimate position. Um, probably not the most accurate, by the way, G4, but just a very nice move to play. Uh, knight E7, knight G6 is possible. Yeah, good move. Good move. Um, I don't want to take as much space as possible. kind of want to play bishop D3. Like I have a lot of options here. Just don't want to fall asleep at the wheel. Don't want to give my opponent more than is necessary. Let's just, yeah, let's develop a piece. This is a good idea. Uh, I have to defend my pawn with bishop here. Gotta, gotta be careful. Like I can't, I can't just lose this pawn. So now I'd, I'd really like to play h4, h5. Push the knight back. h5 is an interesting move by my opponent. Try to get the rook in the game. Another interesting idea is rook c8 to try to go after my pawn. I'm still up the pawn, you know? I really want to go here. <laughs> I really want to play this move. But this move will be a lot stronger if black cannot play h5. It's actually kind of sneaky. So maybe for now I will just take some space to try to play b4 and knight b3 in the future. And on castling, I will play h4, h5. Now, black can play f6. Also, I should castle, probably. But if I castle, I can't play h4. So it's like, it's 
tall balancing act. I'd love to play f5, but that weakens my pawn. And I don't really want to take the knight. I mean, that would be a little bit sad. I kind of kind of don't want to play this move. Um, yeah, I'd love to play h4, h5. Like, I'm waiting for my opponent to castle. Maybe they'll play rook c8. In a position like this, a lot of it is also thinking of what's your worst piece. I think it's this. Naturally, knight b3 comes to mind. And then knight d4. But if I play knight d4, I'm blocking this. So I have to do it all correctly in the right order. I want to go here to make sure everything's guarded, but then I hang my pawn. If I castle, I can't play h4. You know? Information overload. All right, so. Indeed. Now I'm thinking of H4. There it is, let's justify our plan. It was the plan all along. We waited, now H5, I just take, there's no rook. I'm always looking at a strike back, like I'm always looking at black playing f6, but h5 looks really, really nasty to deal with. I mean, the knight is going to get shoved all the way back there, and there's still a, a point to be made. Like, f6 could be a perfectly reasonable, and not just reasonable, it could be the only move to not get completely steamrolled. That's probably not the move. Uh, I get what black is trying to do. But, unfortunately, I think white has a very strong position now. Um, maybe it might be time to castle. I can play king e2 or castle. I actually don't know what the best move is. What can black do? Can black play b5? I have on passant. So let's, let's castle. Yeah, and um, I said in the very beginning, there's that move. It's a little late, but that is, that is definitely still the best move, although I don't have to take. Um, I sort of said in the very beginning, like... This is what could happen. This is a, a kind of a worse nightmare in these Karo Khans. Now, if take, I'm going to take back. So what do I want next? I want to make a plan. Maybe I want to play knight here. Tough to say. Do I wanna, what do I want to do? Maybe I want the bishop on that square. Okay, if you can't decide and everything's sort of spinning, make an improving move. Doesn't weaken anything. Okay? Don't burn all your clock time. We spent 50 seconds on that move. Now, we know that trading is good if you're up. Is it good there? Very tough to say. The side with more space generally wants to avoid trades. The side with less space, which is black, wants to trade because that will open up lines. But we're up, so we want to trade because we're up, right? You see how like chess is very annoyingly confusing? Now, I moved the rook here kind of as an improving move, but now that I see that the file is going to be blocked, maybe I want to do something else. I want to move my bishop, and I can't, so long as my knight is not protecting this pawn. So I think it's finally time to make that move. All right? Black might come in this way. And the question is, do I, yeah, do I get rid of the knight? I mean, you know, maybe black is also trying to play rook f8. That could be a thing. Um, now, now, do I put the rook back on f1 to try to trade, anticipating the opening of the position? Maybe, but if I move my knight, my pawn's not defended. But my bishop can move. Right? Very, oh man, very tough to say. We have to maintain our one-minute time advantage as well. Very important. So one thing we could do here to kind of make it difficult for black to move is we can play like bishop b5. Just get in, pressure, disallow some of these pieces to move. That's always going to be a nice square with good pressure on this pawn as well. And if the game rotates this way, we rotate as well. Just make sure everything is protected. Black is going to be the one that's going to try to trade because black is down. We could guard with the king or the rook. Me personally, I like rook a little bit more. All right? Now there's tactics. 
Stuff is hanging, right? Like, Rook here. Yeah, Black's trying to double. Very, very, very logical decision. Okay. You know, maybe we protect with the king. We're gonna do that. We gotta, you know, we, game is speeding up now. If this rook moves, so important. So important. If that rook moves, that pawn's no longer protected. If you don't spot that, you won't punish Black for their decision making. I think they spotted it as well. Now it's going to be a matter of, do you still go for it, or do you realize it's bad, and it's too dangerous? Uh, chess is hard. It's a hard game. Knight e5 is not possible. A lot of these pieces are struggling to move. I anticipate, like, a knight hop just to make something happen. We're going to trade that off. We're going to trade the rook off, get a lot of pieces off the board. I just said the side that likes to trade pieces that has less space is happier. But the side that is, okay, but what about takes and takes? Can't we do that? Aren't we just picking up a pawn there? I think my opponent was worried about this, but that looks pretty dang good to me. We're going to take and take, and now we are up two pawns, and we're threatening to trade a bishop. And now that we're up two pawns, we're going to start, yeah, we're going to start going for it. I think my opponent wanted to play d4. Opening up this, but they forgot that our knight could actually take the bishop, and that's a that's a big mistake. That's a big mistake. That was made under time pressure, and unfortunately now we will win a whole lot more than a couple pawns. But that was an instructive game. That was an instructive game, and if you're gonna play that Karo Khan, you have to be really, really and I'm just trading. See now. My opponent has less space, but at this point, I hope you can understand, we are totally in the clear to trade, right? We are converting, etc. Um, if you're going to play that line of the Karl Khan, you've got to make sure you are very, very sharp and quick at getting your pawn back, or else within 10 or 15 moves, things could get very, very, very bad. Okay. We won. Um, this was exactly how this opening kind of goes. Um, knight f3, bishop f2, and now this move. And everything was good here. So the instructive moment was that if my opponent had tried to play queen a5, I would have went c3 or queen d2. And the point is that now I have this kind of fork. Or, again, I have this kind of concept of taking the queen. And the knight takes, but the queen stops guarding the bishop. The way my opponent played this, which was very clever, I have to say, was to put my bishop back on f2. There's an argument to be made, bishop g1 is even better. But now, my opponent could have just, and should have just, taken this. Because after it takes, bishop f2 is check. That is the major tactical difference, right? After king takes, knight takes, now we would have had to play this game, and I would have had to show you how to play, and... Uh, my opponent almost did it perfectly, but if you're not extremely accurate in this opening, you will run into this position, and now you will just be brutally shoved backwards, and uh, yeah, this is this is a worse nightmare. And I kind of said that. I said that in the in the beginning of the game, and the best move for Black here would have been to play f6. It was always to try to fight back with the f-pawn. That was the only method. You had to play f6 a little bit faster to give me something to think about. Once you allowed me to get all the maximum of my position and the extra pawn, Black still did a very nice job fighting back. And maybe here the best move practically would have been to sacrifice and just try to open up. But once you played it too slowly, it sort of all fell apart. And it went from plus 0.6 to plus 2 to plus 9. And that's life, unfortunately. Um, I've got two more opponents, uh, and the next one is rated 1800. And has a profile photo of a frog. So... We will, uh, we will... Okay, C4 is the move. I like a lot of things here. One of my favorite courses that I've ever made is a modern... So the modern goes bishop g7. And then the way I like to play the modern in particular against this, again, chess is all about reacting to our opponent's openings, is I like to play bishop d7, queen c8, and bring the bishop down there for a trade. I can't do that right now because my opponent would take this pawn, so I just like to develop my knight to c6 first. 
This is just how I like to do this. Bishop here, queen c8. Yeah. And now you could do this in a handful of ways. Some people here don't rush this castling. At the 1800 level, they still might. And basically the plan is like, I want to trade your bishop. Because this is your very powerful English bishop. And also your king is there. So if I trade that bishop, I will be able to attack your king a bit better using my h-pawn with my rook because I haven't castled. Now, this is not easily preventable. So my opponent is trying to, you know, immediately instigate some counterplay over here. Perfectly reasonable, by the way. Uh, I don't have to play a5. I just kind of like to go ahead with my plan. I mean, I, I, I want to make an English player uncomfortable. Is b5 a concern? Not really, because I can move my knight. Now, I don't take because my opponent would go up with the king. I play h5. Now, the easiest way to deal with this if you're playing with white is to trade, kick out the queen, and shove the pawn back to h4. But that's not everybody's cup of tea. That's not everybody's cup of tea. Not a lot of people like to castle in an English and then play h4, and it's not always the end of the attack either. But this is a very nice way to deal with English players uh, because it makes them really, really, really uncomfortable. Uh, and that's what chess is all about. Like in the last opening, I was trying to make my opponent uncomfortable. Chess is about making your opponents uncomfortable. This should be two, all right? But now I can still play h4. And once this move happens, some people lose in 10 moves. Uh, some people just completely panic here. Now it's too late to kick me out uh, because my pawn has reached h4. Knight takes h4, loses the game to rook takes h4. Now, my opponent also was openly admitting before this game they were very nervous. And that's completely understandable, and uh, I get very nervous too. So, you know, it's, it's part of chess. Uh, and sadly, that's just sort of the reality. But uh, a lot of people here already panic. Like, a lot of people here with white already think, oh my god, I've messed up. Not quite, but we definitely do have a more pleasant game than they do. If b5, I'll even move my knight to the middle, remove another defender of the white king, and once I get rid of these two... I'm getting in there. So I already am looking at taking, taking, and playing the queen to h3. Um, but I don't have to. All right? I don't have to. I, I, I can maybe try to find a little bit more precise way. Uh, but it's definitely an idea. Mm, I'm, I'm also looking at just trading off the knight first. I don't know what the most accurate move here is. Um, another way is to bring the queen, put the queen on the h-file first. Let me think. Some of you may be wondering why I'm not playing takes and h3. Uh, my h-file stays closed that way, and I don't really get the attack that I, that I necessarily desire. It, it doesn't become as powerful as I would like. To me, uh, a very natural move here might, might just be take first and see what happens, but I, I'm not a fan of opening up my opponent's rook. It's a very tough, very tough decision, actually. Very tough decision. What to play here. And again, I, I want to give my opponent the respect they deserve, so I don't really want to bull rush in and kind of go crazy. But you know what? Sometimes I think you have to keep it simple. Let's take, they have to take with the f-pawn, which is uncon uh, uh, unconventional. Normally you want to take toward the center, but that move loses in two moves to bishop takes. Uh, in this case, they have to take away from the center. And I think I'm just going to play it as simple as possible. I am going to take, put my queen there, and target the knight, and just attack. I am not going to overcomplicate things. Because if you overcomplicate things, you can get yourself in trouble. Th this is not a moment you need to think. Okay, takes, and now another question is, where's my opponent going to move the king? My opponent's just very nervous. Right? They are very nervous. I mean, you give me all of this, you're going to get nervous. Now, do I play knight f6, knight g4, or do I play knight e5, removing the defender of the king? I, I mean, it's really tough not to play knight e5, to try to just bring that knight and now h2 can be taken with a check, which is very, very scary. I am also threatening knight d3. I'm also threatening knight c4. And I'm probably just in a vague universe threatening knight g4 just as sort of a backup. I would imagine the best move here for white is something like 
D4. Basically saying, I'll give you this, and you can take, but my opponent didn't do that. Now, knight d3 is possible. I mean, it's a free, it's a free bishop, right? Like, I, I should go for it. I'm worried about my knight getting trapped, but I, it's a free bishop. I mean, it's really hard to. And some of you may be wondering about this check. I probably would have blocked with the pawn, but believe it or not, sometimes just sliding the king out of the way and hiding on f8 is perfectly safe for this opening, which is kind of fascinating. But this just shows you how this modern attack versus the English is so annoying. And English players want a calm game where they impose their will and we're not giving them that. And we're giving them a, 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 a migraine. Now, we're going to win the bishop, and then we're going to try to get in against the king as well. So, um, my opponent did admit they were nervous, you know? And I, uh, and, I, and I played a very mean line. And definitely, if you're nervous, you're not going to play your best. And I just realized, like, there's actually no way to trap my knight because I'm still coming in here. Yeah, so... Look, I just said the easiest way to, to, to finish off a game of chess, right? Trade. And what I would do here, I would just snap this knight off the board. Just snap it off. Like, it, it, it's not necessary at all. Take it. Get out with your knight. And now we are up four points of material. We did our damage. Now we win. Of course, I mean, theoretically, you could resign, like, at, at any point. Like, especially at 1800... People already think that they're so strong, there's no point playing on. I would, I would kind of understand, but uh, I'll offer a knight trade. I don't think my opponent should accept it, obviously, but we'll just do it. Uh, double pawns don't really matter. Being up a knight is, in an endgame is far more important. You could resign, but I, I really wouldn't. I mean, I, I would play on a little bit, and, and you never know when an opponent just kind of like gets lazy and starts making mistakes, and we could still castle our king. Just be a little careful with this knight. Some pawn advancements are possible. Uh, I would castle or just kind of hide my king in the center of the board. I'm going to double up on the h file. Is there a threat? No. Let's play king d7. Double up on the h file. Put some pressure over here and just kind of crash in. It's really tough. I mean, it's, it's, I can even play rook h3. I can play as far as I want to put some pressure. It's just a tough position. There's no counterplay here for white. There's no imbalance. There's no... Which is why I was sort of saying, like, if, you know, if you resign here at, like, 1800, I'll forgive it. If you're 1200 here, you never, there's no point in resigning. 1200's brain short circuit at any point. That's not an insult, it's just life. Like, they, they, they could do something ridiculous at any moment in the game. All right, we're going to double up. I guess knight f1 is the idea. Which is unfortunate that you sort of have to play so passively, but I'm just, I'm, I'm still going to kind of go for it, and I will get the pawn. A sneaky threat, by the way, here is not just on the pawn, but also on that pawn. So this is a very normal tactic. You threaten two pawns if the rook at the end is pinned and not protected sufficiently. Just interesting, sort of something. In the, but knight f1 guards both, by the way. Knight f1 protects against both of those things. Uh, right here, rook g3, right? I could play knight g4. This is a, a hidden backup idea. Just a useful little tactical trick for you to know. Remove this. Just a useful tactical trick. Knight f1. Okay, my rook is hanging. Uh, I guess I will just go right back to, to you know, to the right, just hammering away. Now I'm also, because the G-pawn's gone, I have eyes on that. It's a tough position. I mean, there's no way around it. And, and sometimes that's how it goes. But from a game like this, what my opponent should do is now learn an antidote against that. Or hope they don't see it again, which is actually a relatively reasonable strategy. Because I sometimes play things that aren't that popular. They don't always happen in games. Um, I just realized that this move guarantees me nothing because the rook will just go to G2, which is annoying. I would like to, this is kind of chess thinking right here. I want to target this pawn by going here, but my knight guards my knight right now. So let me go here first, right? This is like, this is the way chess brain works. I want to go here. Target this pawn. I can't because my knight is protected, so I got to guard my knight first. It's tough. It's tough for white to make a move. 
And uh, credit to my opponent, by the way, for playing on, not just kind of resigning out of frustration. And it could be very frustrating. I mean, if you if you start a game and you know you're already nervous and you're kind of in your own head, and then you it goes exactly in the worst way that you envisioned. You're gonna be really harsh on yourself, uh, and I'm preaching to the choir because I'm exactly like that. I mean, I am very much. It's a good move, by the way. I can't take. I'm very much a negative person. Like I, I guess I will take this pawn, threaten rook c2. I frequently speak it into existence, and then I'm like shocked it happened, and it's kind of like, well, you spoke it into existence. Let me give this check. The king has to guard the rook by going here. I'll play knight e5. Oh, that's silly. I forgot about king g3. I mean, there's probably better ways to do this than I am doing it currently. That was kind of silly. Um, although I might have a mate. I might have a checkmate. I might actually be able to change my plan here. I do. I have rook c3, rook f3, rook f5. King g3, rook c3, king f... King f4, rook f3, rook f5. Like I said, always two options. Trade everything or go for... Checkmate. This is a very nasty move. And rook f5 is mate. So is rook h5, by the way. That is kind of mean. The poor king got swarmed. Oh, there's king e4. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of lucky I didn't like lose the whole game there. But it's still mate, actually. Yeah, unfortunately, the position is so strong for black, it's still a checkmate. So pawn takes pawn is a good, sp it's a good spot. King d5, rook d3, king d4, rook d3. That was, uh, yeah, I didn't even see king e4 was legal. I was sitting there going, wait a minute, and now rook d3. That was tough. I feel for my opponent. That was, um, I am curious if I made all the right decisions in that game. Um... But, uh, yeah, I mean, it looks like I did. It looks like, okay, bishop d7 was an inaccuracy according to the computer, but, yeah, h5, h4, and look at the advantage already. That's crazy. Move 9, black is better. And after e3, this whole clarification was correct, and, yeah, knight e4, yeah, and I mean, black is already winning. It just shows you how ridiculously powerful this concept is. And even 1800, like, not fully aware, not fully prepared, like, that could be very, very brutal, so... Um, I'm going to say good game to my opponent. Um, so don't be harsh on yourself. Being nervous before the game can always affect gameplay. Anyway, that's life. I know how it feels. Uh, and in this series, we are wholesome. We are only wholesome. Okay, last game. Against Jacob. Jacob is uh, from Poland. I guess. I don't actually... I, I mean, it could, the flag could be anything. Uh, I've played everything. You know what we could do is we could play B3. I uh, very rarely play like these kind of goofy sidelines, but I will play a Nimso Larsen. And I will just show you how to throw a very strong opponent off their game. You know, 90% of opening study is... All this stuff. So my opponent has already committed a pawn there. Uh, which means... Okay, so they play d5, c5. e3. This is normal. And in general, white has multiple approaches here. One of the white approaches is actually playing f4. So securing control over the center with the, with the f pawn and then putting the knight behind it. Uh, another approach is just to play knight f3. Like, just play knight f3 and play for a more central-based approach, but via this move order. I, I really like f4. I mean, I, I, I love this line, so I'm going to play it. Uh, the critical response for black is always a, a central strike back in the center of the board. i got to raise my level. 2100 rapid is very, very good. Knight c6 is very principled. I can already trade off this knight to relieve some of that pressure, or I can play knight f3. If I play knight f3, I have to think about the fact that what if my opponent plays a6? Then I have to wonder, like, is that a concern? I think I will go bishop b5. I'm going to play bishop b5 to, to get rid of the piece here. There's actually another funny way that the queen could get trapped. This structure existed in the Dutch game. Funny. This overlaps. By the way, the way that I'm playing this, 
overlaps my game uh this one this was a mirror image i guess i shouldn't be analyzing really uh this was a mirror image position look it's mirror image it's with black but uh if we go back to this game um it's a mirror image kind of so my opponent attacks my queen normal stuff uh, I guess I can... Can I take on c6 now? Same kind of concept like in that Dutch game, by the way. Sort of funny. Let's play knight f3. I mean, if my opponent plays rook c8, they play rook c8. But I'll play knight f3 and I'm going to castle. I'm going to play h3. So it's like that Dutch game, but with the colors reversed. Now, 2100 is very, very good. I got to really manage the clock here. I can't just be down four minutes and be like, I'm going to win anyway. 2100 is no joke. Uh, assuming it's legit, 2100. Because like... The truth is, and my opponent is, you know, 100% legit. I'm just saying the pool on chess.com and Rapid is completely unpredictable. It's kind of a shame, actually, but um, it's, yeah, it's life. So if you, if you really like the Dutch, like if you're 2,000 in the Rapid pool on chess.com or frankly anywhere on the internet, like you'll get probably one in 12 cheaters. Probably like 5%, 5 to 8%. One in 12 is what, eight and a half? Uh, and we have, uh, we, ha we have kind of the conclusion of our opening. I think I'll still maybe play for h3. Another idea here is queen e1 with the intention of putting the knight on e5 and putting the queen over here. Let's play maybe queen e1. This queen e1 idea is kind of interesting. Also, just d3 is normal, playing in the style that we did uh, in the Dutch game. d3, knight d2. Knight c3 is also not completely stupid. We'll play d3. d4, e4. Just like in the Dutch game, colors reverse. This is a bit weak. Queen b6, a4 is very good. If a6, a5 is very tricky. Queen b5, knight c3, queen b4, rook a4 wins the queen. Rook a4. I've had that in some games. Here, a4, a6, a5. You can't take with the knight because of the pin. They take the bishop, knight c3, queen has to come forward. Rook a4 is a queen trap. Happened to me before. It's uh, quite funny. But most people just play a6. Or rook c8. A lot of people play rook c8 because they think, I want to not damage... <laughs> oh my goodness. Can that actually... I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think at this level it's possible for that to happen, but... Stranger things have happened. Should I play a4? Should I go for it? Just cheesy? Oh, it's so cheesy. I feel so silly. I mean, the best move is probably to take that. I'm going to go a4. They could play c4 trying to get this. It's not, it's not bad. I mean, it's an idea. I probably have to play like bishop d4 or something. Or queen e2 just to protect this pawn. Like, this is... Okay, well now a5 doesn't work because knight takes. So they didn't fall for the trap. Uh, so now if they play a6, I would just take. Probably would have been smarter to capture a little bit sooner. Uh, if I'm being honest. I probably should not have waited such a long time. Uh, I just decided to be a little bit silly. Let's take now. If they take with the queen, maybe I go for the sneaky knight e5. And we, uh, we play a position with a relatively symmetrical structure. If they take with the pawn, I'm not really sure why they move their queen there. Because I will just push the queen back. Like, damaging your pawns voluntarily is... odd. Queen c6 makes far more sense, considering that's kind of what you signed up for. Okay, let's finish developing. Knight e5 was a clever trick, but then they take my queen, I take their queen, they take, and then I take, and okay, it's... We have a big trade, I mean, I might have some microscopic advantage there, but I do want to show how to justify this very powerful bishop. I do kind of want to show maybe how quickly everything can fall apart in black's position. In black's position, we are, we are constantly monitoring these advancements. It's difficult for black to make any other forward progress. B5 is silly. There's no point having the queen on that square. That's also a weird move. Because you can't play C4, so I don't quite get it. Okay. H3 is... Mm, let's play queen E1. Again, we're going here. And now let's see how Jacob reacts to the threat of the incoming attack. Because like the last game... Knowing you're about to be swarmed is very unsettling. And uh, not to mention the fact that now that I'm unpinned, knight e5 is very potent. 
It's a very different story when my knight gets there uh, and it's not a trade of queens. This is scary stuff. And Jacob's going to think now for a bit. He's probably going to take my knight. I think this is generally a good starting point. Just kind of like, or back the bishop up to g6 and try to make sure it sort of blocks. But that's always going to be a target. I mean, I'm, I'm going to throw everything forward. What I love in my position in this kind of Nimso Larsen reverse Dutch is everything is well protected. Like the position works very, very well together. I'm stopping a lot of advancements. I literally just said that move was going to happen. Do I move my rook? I can also get my rook into the game. Oh, this is very tough. I don't know. Is there any difference? If I take with the knight, technically, I'm allowing c4, but then I'll put my knight on e5. Technically, I'm not allowing c4. Let's take with the knight, put the knight on e5. Tough to say. G takes is probably stupid. Taking with the pawn there. c4, I go here very quickly. I fork, I can take the pawn, and then I'm not attacking, but I'm up a pawn, which looks pretty convincing. Wow. Am I missing something? Now the only question is, do I take, uh, do I take and fork? I want to keep my center together, so I'm thinking take, take, knight e5. Am I missing anything? Queen b6. Maybe I'm missing queen b6, but if I play knight e5 first, queen b6, a5, queen b5. Okay, knight e5, queen b6, bishop d4, bishop c5, I can trade and just win the pawn. I'm pretty sure that just wins a pawn. Take, take, knight e5, queen b6, bishop d4, bishop c5, I even have rook b1 if I want it, and then I'm just up a pawn. The alternative is skip all of this and just try to attack, but... Uh, I didn't see a difference, so I'm going to go here first because it maintains a little bit more tension. Yeah, there's no difference. I mean, I just can't take now because they would take my bishop, but queen b6, bishop d4, bishop c5, I can trade and I can take the pawn on c4. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain it's just good for me. I don't see... Why it wouldn't be. I have other ideas. I mean, I can play queen here with some attack and play like knight d7, but that looks a bit too much. A little bit too much. But uh, this was missed, I think. I mean, that's why my opponent's thinking a lot. Okay, queen c7. They didn't play queen b6. I spent. See, this is chess. You spend all this time calculating your opponent doesn't do what you thought they were going to do. But now I'm just going to win a pawn. Right, like, now I'm up a pawn. I have to be careful. I have to make sure I don't damage something here. Probably will have to defend my pawns against the queen and the rook. It's, it's not like black has what they call compensation, but this bishop is way too powerful. And if black ever tries to start fighting back, I'm just going to threaten mate. I'm going to be like, who are you threatening? So here, this shows you the power of the Nimsa Larson. Let's pre-move knight takes. Probably, right? If, or whatever. We can just sit and relax for a second. Hope this was an instructive episode. I think I played a lot of different interesting openings. I, I probably can take with the pawn as well, but there's absolutely no reason to damage these pawns. Now I'm a pawn up. Now we have to delicately, slowly improve our position. Stop counterplay. Against this, I'm thinking just, 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 oh my good. That looks so good. This looks so hard to deal with now. Now that dark square is completely locked down. Uh, I, I really want to deal with this diagonal by tucking my king to h1, where I think my king is going to be very happy. My knight on c4 is immortal. I don't know how my knight is going to get dealt with. And then I'm just going to advance. I mean, I'm just going to march forward. And um, while threatening mate. Maybe on both diagonals if I'm feeling frisky. I, I just thought about this move. I just, I just said, so what about e4 here? Knight takes, I guess, right? Knight take. But then do, do I have a fork? There's a check. That's why I need my king on h1. Black wants bishop f6. 
I can play bishop e5 first, by the way. Yeah, what if I start with this move? Uh, maybe not. Maybe that wasn't smart. Maybe they're just going to go queen c5 to put some pressure. That might have been a bit silly. But I could always go back. And as a bonus, I can always attack this pawn because, like, that's going to be a weakness too. We can't forget about that. I'm getting a lot of tunnel vision here, but I don't, I don't have to mate. I just have to not lose my pawn somehow. So trading knights and bishops here, trading bishop for knight would be perfect. Because my knight is going to be a beast. It's going to live there. It can't be touched by any of black's pieces. Um, and I definitely like the two minutes up. I mean, two minutes up in, with four versus two is fatal. Um, I think my next move is king h1. I think I've sort of decided that there is no need to do all of this stuff over here. Okay, is knight before a problem? Maybe like a tiny bit. I mean, it's not like the biggest problem, but it's annoying, which is enough of a problem. Let's just, let, let's, let's, let's show what I mean by getting our king out of here. f6 would be a mistake probably because, yeah, bishop f6 makes more sense. Um, f6 would have been a mistake because it would have just weakened more stuff. I, 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 I Following this you know, mentality of, like, we don't have to take. Take us. We're putting stuff on light squares because we don't have a lot of on the light squares. Uh, I, I mean, hey, I like where my knight is. I don't care about double pawns because I'm opening my rook. I'm taking squares away from black, and my knight guards my pawn. So now we can either keep attacking or we can start hammering the queen side. And I, I think it's about that time. I mean, I think it's about that time we switch the plan and we just say, hey, you know, we're, our position is so good. We could march straight down on the queen side as well. But we could continue to threaten the king too. So we could play queen g3. I, I just want to play like a balanced approach, right? Because I know the black knight is probably going there. Black is going to try to fight back. Okay, that also makes sense. Um, this attacks a rook. The rook will go to b8, and maybe I bring some pawns. But then knight c6, all right? Then knight c6. That's not, it's not that easy. These 2100s don't go down. Maybe we go for a queen trade. Maybe we play queen here, queen here. Maybe that's how we try to prove an advantage. Because knight c6 is coming. Maybe that's it. I've decided I'm going to go trade the queen. Or I'm going to just put the queen active in that territory without trading. But I think a queen trade would help in the endgame. I think the queen for black creates a lot of counterplay. And I don't like that. So I think I'm going for a queen trade. Maintaining that two-minute time advantage. Keep in mind what I've been saying throughout this video. You got to apply practical clock pressure too, especially in, in any game you play. 90 minute, 40 minute, you know, 10 minute, 1 minute, 30 second, 8 day chess. I don't know how you can apply pressure in an 8 day chess game, but that's my plan. I'd like to trade Black's Queen and I want to keep applying pressure. There it is. Now, my gut says take with the Rook. But taking with the knight is also, uh, with the pawn is also very appealing because it gets closer to promotion. But I mean, I think take with the rook, right? We just had a very similar thing in the previous game. Uh, that looks like a guaranteed queen trade. And this one I absolutely will take with the pawn because I will get a passer. This pawn will now evolve. Although knight takes is extremely good looking as well. But I think this is just very tough to deal with. I mean, it's going to be a protected pass pawn. Ooh, that's, uh, that's like one of those come and take me moments. Um, I can take and put a knight on d6, but at all times, this guy is coming here. So maybe what we do is we double up on the b-file instead. We want to be taken. But what if I do, remember how in the previous game I moved my rook all the way down? Look at that. Why don't I just do the same thing? All the way down, and here, I kind of anticipate this... Okay, that's, uh, that's a move. Is, are they trying to mate me? Is that, that what's happening? Maybe I trade the queens now. <laughs> now you can't mate me. There you go. Uh, and now I'm playing here. By the way, it's going to be the same tactic. 
It's gonna be the same exact tactic as the previous game. Pattern recognition. Chess is a game of pattern recognition. Look at that. It's the exact same tactic. And that is why you've got to be sharp with your tactics. Now we go, we just start hammering at this pawn. And this was a, this was a contained game. This was a nice game from start to finish. Uh, now we will sacrifice, uh, no, sacrifice, trade. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that won't do it. And let's just make sure we never get back rank checkmate. It just, even at this level, you never know. That's a forced rook trade. That's hanging. Win. That was a nice game. I thought that was a very clean game. And um, I think today I, I, I was pretty sharp. I think I was instructive. I think I was pretty sharp. And okay, that player is 2100. And, you know, I played 94%. So I think I did a, a pretty nice job. It says I, I had a miss. I don't know what the miss was. Better way to connect. Okay. My miss was, you know, already when the advantage was quite, quite strong. Um, but uh, yeah, this moment right here was, was a critical one, and, and Black blundered. I mean, Black played um, c4, but I got to tell you, it's very tough to find a move here for Black. Very tough. Very tough. Like, Black can play a6, I'll play a5, or I'll play queen g3, knight e5, I'll start creating an attack. The computer thinks it's equal, but to me, position is much easier to play for white. Uh, that was instructive, I think. I think there was a ton to learn in this episode. I mean, like, easily over 10 things. Uh, how to outlast at the lower elos, like 900 and 1,000. Uh, how to outlast opponents and, and how to make slightly better opening decisions. Um, how to not evaluate things in words, but rather in, in concrete, eva you know, solutions. Uh... How to make sure that in the opening you're, you're avoiding the worst nightmare, like the worst case scenario, and also just being sharper a little bit in the tactics, because if you float out in the first 10, 15 moves in a dangerous opening already, you'll just get a losing position. But also in that third Karl Khan game, preventing counterplay. In the fourth game, we attacked in English, and in this game, we played a Nimso Larsen. It was actually a reverse Dutch, which was very instructive. Uh, and we followed the game plan, I think, to a T. Opponent blundered, and we capitalized and consolidated, so... That's how to win a chess. Uh, if you want to get into a future episode, like I said, it's generally uh, it's generally Twitch subscribers, but it's people in the, the Discord. And um, I don't stream a whole lot nowadays, but when I do, people some still are still subbed. And um, if you like my content and you're below 1,200, I would say check out my book if you'd like or any of my courses, they all have free samples, and I played a bunch of these openings in today's video, I always do, uh, and that's all. See you in the next episode. Get out of here.